Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Winchester Unitarian Society, a wellspring of progressive religion in the Mystic Valley. As Unitarian Universalists, our faith does not require us to believe in any particular tenet or creed, and among us, we believe many different things. But our faith does call on us to do certain things. Among them, we strive to recognize and affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And following from that, our faith calls on us to radically welcome anyone and everyone who chooses to gather with us. Whether you're a newcomer or an old stalwart, we're glad that you're here. Just a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I want to, uh, our music director, uh, unfortunately, is not here today. He's home recovering from COVID. Hopefully, he will be back with us soon. And in his place, I want to uh, extend tremendous thanks to the dynamic jazz combo entitled Covering for John, consisting of Tyson Kamikawa on sax, Maury Wood on bass, Steve Forcucci on guitar, and special guest Dan Hermes on keyboards. Thank you very much. Um, for those who are interested, there will be a discussion of John Lowy's reflection that will take place after the service in the parlor at noon, and it will be possible to participate in the discussion via Zoom, not through the live stream, but through Zoom. Uh, there was an email that went out on Friday giving uh, directions for that. But if you missed the email, you can go to the Winchester Unitarian Society website and find the link, which is the, the old link for Sunday services that we used to use, and it's prominently displayed on the uh, homepage. Now, let's take a moment and just greet each other. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Physics makes it clear we didn't need you. I like science and sometimes I go woo. Instead of praying, take the vaccination for the flu. When the universe was born, it was an accident. Molten lava burning brightly so blue. When it cooled, came the world, I say politely, we are here. Where are you? We are here. Where are you? You're not the reason I continue. Forget the plan. There is no plot. Just love on a rock. Love on a moving rock. First to light up the night and to feed the soul's delight. Here the chalice burns bright and burns strong. Using all our reason, building till the dream is done. Here the chalice burns bright and burns strong. Open minds from the start, helping hands, loving heart. 
Here the chalice burns bright and burns strong. Free from creed, dogma too, principles to guide us through. Here the chalice burns bright and burns strong. And now would you please rise in body or in spirit and sing hymn number 86, where the summer sun is shining.
Whoops. We now come to the part of our service, which only occurs in the summer. Uh, we take a few moments to acknowledge joys and sorrows uh, that people have, have in their lives right now. If you would like to light a candle um, to mark a joy or a sorrow, please come up and uh, do so. You are welcome to say your name and very briefly state what the joy or sorrow is about. If you prefer to keep that private, you may do that as well. Um, so. Hi, my name is Dennis Brett, and it's very pleasant that everybody's here today and enjoying John's uh, service that he prepared. Uh, I have a sorrow that I'd like to share. My, I received an email from my sister saying that her husband, my brother-in-law, uh, has been hospitalized with a severe heart condition, and she didn't specify what it was, and obviously she's at the hospital and busy, and she hasn't answered the phone. So I don't know exactly what that means. He has not had heart difficulties in the past, but keep him in your thoughts and prayers. His name is Bob Flynn. Thank you. I don't like to do a lot of work. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Sorry, I left my other hand home. Um, I'd like to take a moment to, um, if this is a joy, uh, to welcome my nephew, Joshua, who's going to be here for three months. Um, he's, um, he loves music, plays music, and unfortunately he missed your opening session with the three of you. So There's more. There's more. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just very, uh, this is a joy. I'm just very happy this weekend. My brother-in-law, John's brother Mark, and my niece Melania came to visit. And we gathered yesterday with my daughter and my granddaughter and my son-in-law and just had a wonderful time getting, you know, just being together. And she got to meet um, our grandchild, Melania, uh, Ayla. A sorrow that I've had in my life, well, this is nothing new, but, but COVID has not been a very easy time for me, and my life has been very problematic since, the, since this, and, and I'm happy to find solace in this community of, of great people. Uh, hello there. Uh, my name is Connor Irez, uh, and I want to remember uh, I have a sorrow. You see, uh, two days ago on the 15th, a couple days ago on the 15th, it marks the anniversary, the one-year anniversary, where my sweet hamster biscuit died. This may seem a little silly, as I have had multiple hamsters, but biscuit was my first hamster 
and the amount she taught me about pet care, how we treat our pets, how we view them, how we, how we really just treat. And I realized how many people don't understand this. I go onto YouTube and I see so many people buying these small cages or, or mistreating their pets and they don't even know it. Or sometimes they do it for views like Whenever I see a hamster maze video, I just get sad because the poor hamster is subjected to so many dangerous obstacles, and yet the owner doesn't seem to care. This goes for any pet, to dogs, to fish. And without Biscuit, and even my other hamsters, Pumpkin and Ferdinand, I wouldn't have my sweet Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, Benny Wiggles. Good morning, my name is Fritzy Nace. Um, I've been away for a few services, but it's always nice to be back in this community and see so many familiar faces and some new faces. Um, and I feel that joy and sorrow is sort of weaving in and out all the time. Um, yesterday, my neighbor showed me a baby bird that had just hatched in a nest in their bushes. And this morning, there was a pigeon that had gotten hit by a car on the side of the Rotary struggling to get out of the way, so I was able to stop and pick him up and just move him over to the bushes. So it's sort of a constant weaving, and I'm grateful for the sunshine and all the beauty of the flowers um, and the weather. So thank you for lighting a candle. Okay, I'm going to light one more candle for all of the joys and the sorrows that are in our hearts that remain unspoken. Now have a moment of silence. Please hold in readiness hymn number 101, Abide With Me.
slide three. So I'm going to introduce today's reading, and uh, this is actually a theist reading, and I, it's from uh, a book that I, you actually can download as a PDF. Uh, it's an old book. It was written back in 1815, American Unitarianism, or a brief history of the progress and present state of Unitarian churches in America by Reverend Thomas Belsham. And uh, this is the fourth edition. And basically this was, he extracted the memoirs of the life of Reverend Theophilus Lindsay, uh, which was printed in 1812 in London. And Theophilus Lindsay was writing probably these notes back in the late 1700s. Uh, and it just gives you a feeling because I'm going to talk about change a lot and just the feeling where we were in our history. God cannot be unjust to any of his creatures. Having brought men into existence and placed them in circumstances of imminent peril Though in the nature of things, misery is necessarily connected with vice, we may conclude that none of the creatures of God in such or in any circumstances will ever be made eternally miserable. Indeed, it is plainly repugnant to the justice of God that the existence to any of his intelligent creatures should be upon the whole a curse. So the next excerpt. The scriptures contain a faithful and credible account of the Christian doctrine, which is the true word of God, but they are not themselves the word of God, nor do they ever assume that title. It is highly improper to speak of them as such, as it leads inattentive readers to suppose they were written under a plenary inspiration to which they make no pretension, and as such expressions expose Christianity unnecessarily to the cavils of unbelievers. Start the reflection, and I'm going to start by piggybacking off of the reading in that when we look at our historical context, uh, we were so ahead of our time, even back in the late 18th century to the early 19th century, speaking about Christianity in a way that didn't have a lot of magic, let's call it that. And I think part of what this was trying to get at was it was just about that period of time when atheism was beginning to become okay. What I mean by okay was it was something that somebody could wear as a badge of pride and it wasn't as much of an insult. And I think that uh, if more of the readings, if more people would pay attention to each other, in the groups that we are in, we might be able to come closer, but come closer in a way where we knew we were all working together. Atheism is a great topic for a Unitarian Universalist church sermon during the lazy days of summer especially when we can listen to this great jazz music and kick back. I mean, there's a groove about that that makes you want to just relax. Still, it is a topic that can fly in so many directions, but no worries. To accompany this reflection, I have also created a PowerPoint slide presentation that will be made available to those who are interested. 
And that PowerPoint presentation, I was working on it last night because it was too long. And mo most of the slides are in the backup, but you can benefit from that as well. My opening words were meant to serve as an example to connect with today's reflection topic. What is meant when I am an atheist is said. It is my starting point. It is very natural for me to say I am an atheist because for most of my youth and younger adult life, I could not relate to spirituality connected to anything. I had no idea on what I believed. And it didn't matter. Still, I was always respectful of other people's worship rituals and practices. Live and let live came naturally to me. So when I came across what I felt were unnatural religious, religious dogma, another example I could have chosen as an answer to what is meant when I am an atheist is said, is the pictorial, de pictorial depiction of the man kicking the cross off the top of the mountain, illustrated in slide seven. Maybe that's your way to express that. The point is that the topic is not believing in a deity or a God may be different for everyone, and it changes. At one time in my life, uh, it worked for me, but over the years, I have changed. And it's not that I'm gonna be repulsed by what I see here, but it's not the way I feel about how people might view atheism. The point is that the topic of not, among the things I might say include, okay, the, when I say I have changed, today I am someone who has tried to make a relationship with God in a variety of ways under different circumstances. And I've been doing that for the last 40 years of my life. And I talk to God. Among the things I might include or say, and I do this a lot, thank you, God, during a moment of a beautiful sunset or a breathtaking view from a mountaintop. Thank you, God, when I need my dogs to behave, and they do. Thank you, God, when the police flag me down and they give me a warning instead of a speeding ticket. Thank you, God when I look at my wife and realize she's married to me. However, most of the time, especially lately, I find myself saying, God, why? 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 God, please help me. I need you so badly in my life. God, Jesus, I need you. Please come into my life. Forgive me. God, have mercy on me. So when I try to answer the question that I propose as the sermon topic, I do not say this lightly. First, I think of my whole life's journey and the times that I absolutely knew that I spoke with God. But now, all of what I recollect feels like a long time ago. And I am starting to have my doubts about any of it. I've spent so much time asking for God to come into my heart, to come into my life. I have prayed in all sorts of positions. I have tried disciplining myself through meditation, no sex, fasting, being generous with others, volunteering my time to make a difference on the planet. When Christian religious fundamentalists ask me whether I have accepted Jesus as my savior, I look at them straight in the eye and say, absolutely, I have done that. But the cherry on top 
is that right around 2002, 2003, I joined the Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist Church, and I have been coming here since immersing myself with all of us like-minded people, and yet not agreeing with you on maybe most of your liberal positions. The most important reason that I keep coming back is because at this church, the meaningfulness of a spiritual experience will be met by skeptical eyes that are not attached to any dogma as we dare to share what's real with each other. At this church, believing in God is optional. I wouldn't have it any other way. At least it's still permitted. Part of my motivation for the reflection is to explore both the question of being an atheist when it is asked and the assumptions that we are bringing to the statement when it is spoken and heard by others. So feeling that jazz groove and that inherent dignity thing, I'm putting it out there to my compadres, my comilitonen. In 21st century, it's all about the science culture. Can I be an atheist who also wants God in his life? Because that's what my karma is starting to feel like. First, let's create a framework for the definition of atheism, slide eight. On slide eight, I have captured what is atheism from the American Atheists Organization website. The American atheists describe themselves as the premier organization fighting for the civil liberties of atheists since 1963. I've highlighted the points made that atheism is too often defined incorrectly. And then to be clear, it is not a disbelief in gods or denial in gods, it is a lack of belief in gods. Slide nine. For the purpose of this reflection, slide nine displays my non-expert attempt to be concise when answering the question, what is atheism? I want you to know, I, when I was doing this for this sermon, I had like eight other slides that I went through and I had to kind of do this. This, at least for me, is not as easy to put down in a concise way. So, I'm, but you still gotta take a plunge and here's my plunge. And I, I tried to, 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 to make it uh, in a way that it would speak to everybody. I'm trying to think of all audiences by uh, talking about the re rejection and the uh, four bullet points of religions, and I included other religions because there's so many other religions. Slide 10. Slide 10 captures the perspective found in a presentation made through the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy how best to define the terms atheism and agnosticism is surprisingly contentious. The website is there and you can read through that. It's not, it is very long. It is not my plan to torture you regarding the subject matter depicted in the table of contents. And I just invite you to go see this. But it's another point to be, set, to be made when we define our terms Let's be okay with each other when we don't exactly become on the same place or, and, and, and have to noodle every word. So up to now, I, trimply, I have simply tried to establish a working framework on defining atheism, uh, which, and hopefully I'm trying to minimize a potential contentious issue. The next part of the framework centers on how the concept of atheism has changed over time in relation with the history of religion and God. Slide 11. I've chosen as examples the three books depicted. The first two books were written to cover the history and origins of God. Much of my motivation today's reflection is influenced by the book A History of God 
by Karen Armstrong. I'm not going to really discuss the other two books, uh, except the third book is one that maybe you should sort of look at in terms of these reflections because it's going to be one of those books that may not come as one that maybe seems as well suited. So I will go back. When I pick up Karen Armstrong's book, A History of God, the introduction informs us that based on her extensive study of the history of religion, that human beings turn out to be spiritual animals in general. She makes the point that as soon as men and women became recognizably human, they began to worship gods as they created works of art. So just like any time in history, early human faiths expressed the need to understand the mystery of the unknown of this beautiful and yet terrifying world. That sounds a lot like me. It is worth pointing out that early in her life, Miss Armstrong was also searching for a relationship with God. This led her to enter a religious order where she became a nun. She, dared, she shares with the reader her experience of the failure she felt in her own words and on her search for God. Then she writes, eventually with regret, I left the religious life. I felt my belief in God slip quietly away. When I read this part of her introduction, I became humble regarding my own experience and became immediately connected to her experience of failure in not being able to quench the thirst of her search and indeed quench the thirst of my search. I'm going to take a sip of water. Slide 12. This is some overview of Western Europe with some other moments that I'm trying to, 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 to kind of pick to really get at the idea of the change and how everything just simply changes. And for most of history, it did not pay to be an atheist. And what I gotta say about that is, you know, I, in doing this research, I have so much more compassion for being an atheist, realizing in the history of people who were this way, how much they were tortured, how much they were used in, 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 in so many settings. And again, it's because I've got you guys at this church keeping me going in the way that's honest. For most of history, it did not pay to be an atheist. Earlier in history, Jews, Christians, and Muslims might have all been called atheists by pagans. Until the 17th and 18th century, an accusation of one party calling another party an atheist was a tactic used when disagreements escalated between parties who did not like each other. Being called an atheist was an insult with potential repercussions. If the atheist slur stuck, it might have gotten you executed. Now let me tell you, just to come here today, how to experience that difference. Some people say, did you test, did you take a test for COVID? Did you take a test for COVID, okay? And I'm gonna say, I'm not taking a test for COVID unless I feel symptomatic. And we may disagree and we may not like each other's opinion on that. But if, and I might say, he's an atheist. But it ain't gonna get me anywhere. People had incentives to call people atheists for the longest period of time in our history. Towards the end of the 18th century, the groundwork for attitudes around the denial of God's existence were becoming increasingly acceptable, if not desirable. In fact, at the time Unitarian Church publication was first coming out, there were some philosophers who were proud to call themselves atheists, a small minority. The point is the term atheist was starting to turn the corner 
from being considered an insult to one of pride. Slide 13. For me, a notable observation follows from Dennett Diderot, and forgive my pronunciation of his name, who was a prominent figure during the Age of Enlightenment, best known for serving as a co-founder, uh, chief editor, and contributor to the encyclopedia, along with Jean Le Rond de Le Rond. He wrote the book, The Skeptic's Walk, the book was completed in 1747, and yet it was only published in 1830. Kept getting lost. Police had it. The book separated into two parts, the first being a critique of religion, and the second is a philosophical debate. The book is said to reveal the intellectual development of Diderot during the time it was written, and is considered to be the turning point in Diderot's transition to atheism. The book questions the integrity of both the Bible and the Abrahamic conception of God. But what was the set of ideas in combination with age of science giving new pride to the atheist? Slide 14. The evidence for God is really of little use if a person does not want him in his or her life. That was the point in the letters that you see going between him and Voltaire. Diderot himself denied that he was an atheist. He simply said that he did not care whether God existed or not. When Voltaire objected to his book, he replied, I believe in God, although I live very well with the atheists. It was a way to not, he was already at one point put into prison for some of his very strong views. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like having something bad happen to you to have an incentive to find a way to make it work for yourself. Wrong page, okay. It's very, he would say, it's very important not to mistake hemlock for parsley. But to believe or not to believe in God is not important at all. With unerring accuracy, Diderot had put his finger on the essential point. Once God has ceased to be passionately a subjective experience, he does not exist. And, and that, I, I looked at this and I tried going around to seeing how others were viewing things. And this was like, if he was here today, he would want to listen to the jazz music as I was telling you these particular points. Because he would say it in a relaxed sort of a way. He could say it in a comical way. I bought that book and I'm reading it. The hidden God had become deus otiosis. Whether God exists or not exists, he has come to rank among the most sublime and useless truths. So, hey man, if he exists, so what? So what? I don't care. Thing is, I do care. It isn't that, I, I'm happy that that could be okay for people that he doesn't exist for them and people don't want him. I want God. Is that okay with you that I want God? Can I be an atheist and want God? Slide 15. I chose these five books to present on atheism that were recommended by Susan Jacoby, an American author, in a 2018 interview. Susan is an atheist and a secularist. Her 2008 book about American anti-intellectualism, the age of American unreason, was a New York Times bestseller. During her interview, I was impressed by her thoughtfulness in that she recommended a set of books, not necessarily the best books on atheism, but instead essential as a collection of books together to understanding what she felt was the merits of atheism. 
I, slide 16. I performed a current search and slide 16 depicts the top three best books on atheism according to the website findthisbest.com. The date was uh, June 17th, a month ago. So it's pretty up to date. The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins appears on both my atheism book list and the and Susan Jacoby's. So that's the one I'm going to read first. Slide 17. There's a new book. And that book was also in the list because it was one of the best ones uh, in, in the list I just presented. Is Atheism Dead? Is a book written by Eric Metaxas. And I can say to you, I can't, I'm not going to go deeply into it, but it's going to be another book that we all should be acquainted with because this is a book that uh, picks up on science and picks up on archaeology and picks up on areas where they haven't been discussed before. Let me just put it that way. If you go to slide, the next slide, um, these are basically the overall, sent an overview of the book that I picked. I looked at a lot of reviews and I wanted to see some reviews that gave me a, a feeling for giving you a feeling for what the book is going to say without my getting more deeply into it. I did buy that book as well. I've started to go through it. It's, it's going to push buttons when you read certain places for people in our group. But, but why? Pushing buttons is what we do. Just, we just have to make it OK for each other to be with each other. I'm going to end pretty quickly. Of course, an atheist can't prove there isn't a God because you cannot prove a negative. The atheist basically says that based on everything I see around me, I don't think so. Every rational thing I see and have learned about the world around me says there isn't a God. But as far as proving there isn't a God, no one can do that. Both the atheist and the agnostic say that. And here's the wisdom that I want to impart. So I say to those of you who have the clarity of being atheist, who have not come by this clarity after first trying to have a relationship with God, that there is an opportunity to use the blessing of your clarity with kindness towards those who you may come into contact for whom God still matters. People like me. But there are a lot of people like me in Unitarian Universalism. I'm talking about those people who you know have God in their heart. They're searching all the time and need you in their lives because the highest form of wisdom is kindness. That is our humanity. So may, maybe the world will evolve to a new normal of spirituality. Can I be an atheist that wants to have God? Because if that's so, then I'm going to start to think and say, when will you appear to me so I can beg you not to leave? When will you appear to me so I can beg you not to leave. When will you appear to me so I can beg you, so I can beg you not to leave? I'm going to close the sermon. I am going to read to you the piece that I know 
where we all can come together. And it is by an evangelist, the greatest thing in the world, Henry Drummond. The world is not a playground. It is a schoolroom. Life is not a holiday, but an education. And the one eternal lesson for us all is how better we can love. As Unitarian Universalists, we strive to live our values in how we act, in how we speak, and in how we allocate our resources. The offering is one opportunity to put Unitarian Universalist values into practice by contributing to the support of the many works of this religious community. You may donate through PayPal or through the Winchester Unitarian Society website, which has instructions for various different ways of contributing, including by text message. Or you can write an old-fashioned check and mail it to the Winchester Unitarian Society, 478 Main Street, Winchester, Mass, 01890. Please write or type the offering for today's date in the memo line or comment field. And our practice is to invite first-time worship attendees to be our guests in lieu of a contribution Please just complete a visitor card found in the uh, rack in the front of the pew in front of you, or uh, fill out a virtual visitor card, and the URL is uh, listed in the live stream, so that we can remain connected beyond this Sunday. Your generously given offering will now be gratefully received. Those who wish to do so are invited to join in reading together the community affirmation. We gather not for ourselves alone, but to use our common power to build the beloved community within and beyond these walls. We create and reaffirm this covenant this day to make justice flourish, to practice compassion amidst difference, and to embody transformative love. And now please rise in body or in spirit and sing hymn 331, Life is the Greatest Gift of All. <clears throat>
So uh, this part, check. Um, I, before I, I get to it, I want to say that Sam Berliner III was one of those individuals for the over the years who's come to summer services who spoke to me about being an atheist and we had so many wonderful discussions and sometimes you know they were uh, confrontations but I love the man and I miss you Sam wherever you are and this Benediction is taking words from a song from the head and the heart, lost in my mind. Put your dreams away for now. I won't see you for some time. I am lost in my mind. I get lost in my mind. Mama once told me, you're already home when you feel loved. I am lost in my mind. I get lost in my mind. Oh, my brother, your wisdom is older than me. And oh, my brother, don't you worry about me. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. Don't worry about me. Ooh, 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 ooh,
now please say with me uh, the words printed in your order of service for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. The service has ended, but our life of service continues. Please let's meet outside for uh, some kind of refreshments and then inside the, in the parlor for a discussion of today's topic. <laughs>